Good morning, everybody in San Francisco. I'm Alan Wien, the Founders Professor and Emeritus Chief of Urology and Director of the Residency Program here at Penn. And it's my pleasure to participate in this really well-planned UCSF lecture series. Today, I'm gonna to talk about overactive bladder. These are my potential conflicts of interest. And this is what I'm gonna to try to get through today. Uh, how'd the term come about? <clears throat> What's the true definition? What's wrong with the definition? Who really needs or desires treatment? What's the pathophysiology? What's the management? <clears throat> Um, behavioral modification, drugs, combinations, and then refractory OAB. I think I probably will not get through new agents and future possibilities. As we go along, you'll see that on the surface, overactive bladder sounds like a pretty simple-minded topic. But the more you know about it, unfortunately, the more it turns out that it's really not so simple, and many things about it are not terribly concrete or settled. My suggestion to uh, our residents always is when you're looking for sources about something, um, and let's say lower urinary tract in particular, you have the AUA guidelines, which have an extensive list of references. You have the European Association of Urology guidelines, which are actually revised every year or two, which makes them, I think, somewhat more valuable. And they always have an extensive set of references. And with regard to the lower urinary tract, the International Consultation on Incontinence <clears throat> has a meeting every three to four years, following which they bring out a text called Incontinence that deals with basically everything except for obstruction that's related to lower urinary tract dysfunction. And you'll see a lot of what I have today, the references are from those. So first of all, how did the term overactive bladder come to be? Well, in 1997, Paul Abrams and I were approached uh, by actually a pharma company who wanted us to chair uh, a symposium on something that they would like titled the unstable bladder, because that was the name for detrusor overactivity at the time. Neither of us really liked the term, um, and so basically we were charged with coming up with a new term, but presenting the same material at that conference. Uh, basically, it was what we consider to be the overactive bladder. So we came up with the name overactive bladder. This was basically the page in the journal that introduced the proceedings of that symposium. And the original goals of substituting overactive bladder <coughs> for bladder instability or unstable bladder <clears throat> was to be able to have a pretty common term that described what we thought was a very common condition and turned out to be a very common decision. We wanted the term to be understood by primary care providers, including advanced practice practitioners and specialists. We wanted it to be a term that implied an initial non-invasive evaluation and treatment possible with no complicated, expensive, or invasive studies. And we wanted there to be some safeguards, meaning a laundry list that basically told these people what they should refer onward, really, uh, from the start. And basically, this is the laundry list that we came up with. Um, <clears throat> failure to respond to conservative treatment, hematuria, recent genitourinary surgery, significant pelvic prolapse, that's how we defined it, abnormal digital rectal exam in the male, complex neurologic disease, urinary retention, and any sort of pelvic or genital pain. We thought that most of those or all of them really demanded a more extensive workup and someone was not going to be able to treat this conservatively or without some sort of further invasive workup. Okay, so the definition. The original definition that was formulated by the International Continence Society in 2002, a symptom syndrome, not a disease, not a condition, but a symptom syndrome that consists of urgency, the key, the key word, 
with or without, originally it was urge incontinence, but we recognize later on that was incorrect because urge is a normal sensation, urgency is not. So urgency incontinence is what it was changed to later, usually with frequency and nocturia. Now, this is also a part of the definition. You may not be aware of this. In the absence of an underlying metabolic or pathologic condition. Why do we put this in? Good question. I think we weren't thinking clearly. We'll talk more about this later. Now, what is urgency? Obviously, if that's the primary term and the definition, you have to have a pretty good definition of that in itself. So in 1998, urgency was defined again by the ICS as a strong desire to void accompanied by a fear of leakage or pain. It was redefined when the definition of overactive bladder was formulated as a sudden compelling desire to pass urine that's difficult to defer. Why did we take fear of leakage out? Well, we shouldn't have. I think we should have left it in. Again, I think no committee is perfect, and we on that committee certainly proved that. This is just basically a Venn diagram of where overactive bladder symptoms sit. You can have overactive bladder wet with urgency urinary incontinence, about a third of patients with OAB have in your urgency incontinence. You can have OAB dry, two thirds. You can have OAB and stress urinary incontinence. The one thing that's always left out is mixed symptoms. Mixed symptoms to me means someone that has stress urinary incontinence and overactive bladder dry. In other words, mixed incontinence, if you read the definition or read what's included in mixed incontinence in the literature, it's usually says a combination of stress incontinence and urgency incontinence but that leaves out the people that have stress incontinence and overactive bladder, but they just don't have urgency urinary incontinence. I think there should be another category that we refer simply to as mixed symptoms. So what does urgency do? I mean, what are the consequences? Well, it causes increased frequency. It drives all the behavioral adaptations that people with OAB do, fluid restriction, always knowing where the bathroom is, prophylactic voiding, and restriction of a number of activities. It, it precedes urgency urinary incontinence, and at night it can result in nocturia um, or urgency urinary incontinence. Now, OAB is not one of the predominant causes of nocturia, and that's why the OAB medications don't work very well for nocturia. If you treat urgency and you're successful, that will result in improvement in all or most of the other symptoms of overactive bladder. Nice diagram by Chris Chappell showing what urgency does in terms of the other symptoms of OAB. It's really the driver. So let's see why it's not so simple. Is urgency a dichotomous or continuous variable? Is urgency all or none? Are there grades of severity of urgency? Does urgency always end in a void or a leak? Another one of Chris Chappell's diagram. Is urgency like something on the left where it's a light switch, it's either on or it's off? Or is it like on the right where you have various degrees of some sensation that winds up with urgency? Or is it a combination of the two? Well, my personal opinion is that urgency can be truly episodic with no prior urge, because urge is a normal symptom. It's what you get when you feel as though you have to go to the bathroom, you can postpone it, you can do it now, you can do it later, etc. But urgency can be purely episodic or I think urgency may also occur as the final sensation following a gradual buildup of the urge to void, but with a definite point at which urge changes to urgency. 
I think that, again, my personal opinion, urgency is episodic. There's a point where it occurs, but it can also vary in intensity. In other words, you can have a sudden compelling desire to void that's difficult to defer, but you can defer it. Or you can't defer it, it results in a leak or somewhere in between. So in many of the studies on overactive bladder, you'll see urgency graded as to whether the proposed treatment made it better or not. Does urgency always end in a void or a leak? No, it can be suppressed. And in fact, two thirds of the patients with overactive bladder do not have urgency incontinence. And in fact, teaching people how to suppress urgency is part of the behavioral modification regimen that we'll discuss. Is urgency always associated with detrusor act overactivity on urodynamic studies? No, the answer is no. Urgency can exist without detrusor overactivity. In fact, this used to be called in the lexicon of the ICS sensory urgency, which I thought was a great term. In other words, you have a, usually a decreased bladder capacity where someone feels urgency, but there's no detrusor overactivity. You know, now this is simply called hypersensitivity without detrusor overactivity. Now, the presence of urgency urinary incontinence, on the other hand, demands the presence of detrusor overactivity. And sometimes you'll see an article, you know, written where they talk about urgency incontinence and the percent that had detrusor overactivity on urodynamic studies. Well, I mean, that's silly because you have to have detrusor overactivity in real life to have urgency urinary incontinence, or else you'll simply have urgency. So urgency urinary incontinence really sort of demands detrusor overactivity. This is an interesting study done by Hashim Hashim and Paul Abrams. A lot of patients with lower urinary tract symptoms, 64% of the patients that had overactive bladder had detrusor overactivity. So 36% did not on urodynamics. 83% of patients with detrusor overactivity on urodynamics had overactive bladder. Interesting to statistics to remember. So the current definition of overactive bladder is not perfect and I've alluded to some of the problems previously. The term urgency as the sine qua non, think about this, eliminates what we used to call reflex incontinence. Now reflex incontinence was the kind of incontinence that occurred in a spinal cord injury patient after a complete transection, let's say, you know, a T10, after spinal shock had worn off. So reflex incontinence referred to any leakage due to involuntary bladder contractions or decreased compliance without sensation. You see that in some elderly people who have detrusor overactivity causing leakage and they just have no sensation. Well, I mean, that's still overactive bladder to my way of thinking, but unfortunately without urgency, without that symptom, it's not included in that category. The pathology exclusion eliminates overactive bladder symptomatology due to any one of the things on this slide. Now, overactive bladder is a symptom syndrome. It's a group of symptoms. Now, to eliminate urgency and frequency and maybe urinary incontinence because of infection or carcinoma in situ or a stone in the distal ureter or bladder, etc. I mean, it seems to me that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You're being too restrictive. The point is, the symptoms are the same and the treatment of the symptoms of overactive bladder, if you can't cure the condition right away, is the same. And you should always look for a presumed direct cause and treat that, obviously. So however you wanna define overactive bladder, I think conceptually in your head that it's really more logical to think of it this way. It can be neurologic, spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, et cetera or it can be non-neurologic. If it's non-neurologic, 
you can divide it into those cases that are due to an identifiable cause, UTI, stone, all the things on that previous slide, and those are presumably reversible, the condition, or they can be without an identifiable cause, in which case they're idiopathic. Now, they may not always be discrete boundaries, but I think you get the idea of how to think of this conceptually, and the treatment of the symptoms of overactive bladder is the same. So here's the Venn diagram again. Remember mixed symptoms. Remember a third of OAB sufferers have urgent continence or urgency. See, even I made the mistake. So what about interstitial cystitis? Well, that's a separate entity. This means painful bladder syndrome. Now, I see PBS patients generally have pain. It can be in the pelvis, the vagina, the urethra, or perceived in the bladder but they have pain. I see PBS patients generally don't have detrusor overactivity or urgency incontinence. Now, are there people who have both? Yep, there are. And are there exceptions to this rule? Yes, there are. But Paul Abrams and Phil Hanno and I just came up with this very simple-minded diagram. And I think by and large, it's true. And it's not, you can have these two together, true. And there are some cases that don't fit exactly into this, but by and large, it is true. How common is overactive bladder? These are four different series divided by age. Uh, the Noble series was the one done in the US, first of all. Epic and Epi Lutz were done in, in Europe. Uh, this was obviously done in Finland, very low for some reason, uh, but you can see that the estimates really vary depending on how you collect the data. Look at the difference between uh, Noble and Epic. Now, Epilutz was in patients greater, or people, not patients, greater than 40 years. And the Noble was in anybody who was over the age of 18, but most of them were in their mid-30s or over. Now, just some simple diagrams. This was the original Venn diagram from the Noble series. It was actually based at Hopkins. So 17% of people over the age of 18 at the time, that's what that equated to, divided roughly into one thirds wet and two thirds dry. Now, interestingly, you might think it's more common in women, it's not. It's just as common in men as it is in women. The only difference is that men are more apt to have overactive bladder dry, probably because they have a prostate and a stronger sphincter mechanism. And women are more apt to have overactive bladder wet. Well, look at all those people that have overactive bladder. So is the prevalence equivalent to the need for or the desire for treatment? Um, you know, folks who, who make products obviously would, would like to say, well, sure, but it's not, I don't think, at least that's my opinion. And in order to say that someone with minimal symptoms should be treated or non-bothersome symptoms, you would have to hypothesize that the symptoms progress if they're not managed. Now, in some individuals they do, but I suspect the progression is the result of other factors like pelvic ischemia that you see in aging, obstruction, or pelvic floor dysfunction, as you see in prolapse. The symptoms also regress. So in my opinion, non-bothersome symptoms do not constitute an indication for treatment because I don't believe in the hypothesis that they necessarily progress. So who is it that needs or wants treatment? Well, the desire for treatment in patients with overactive bladder, I think results from number one, those who have urgency incontinence more than let's say a small amount once a month, that's generally the factor that constitutes the greatest desire for treatment. People that have frequent episodes of urgency during the day, now, people that have nocturia 
you know, that's a very bothersome symptom, but you have to remember that most cases of nocturia are not due to overactive bladder. People that have daytime frequency, actually, that, that's probably the least bothersome thing. Uh, because if you just had frequency without the urgency, um, and you could sort of trade that off for urgency uh, or nocturia, et cetera, the frequency is going to bother you the least. But what determines the desire for treatment, actually, is what I call the integral effect of whatever symptoms you have on the various spheres of quality of life, which you'll see in the next slide. And everybody has a different threshold. It's clearly different for older people than younger people, for people that have a high-powered uh, anxiety-producing occupation, especially if the, their bathroom at their job is on you know, two floors up, or if they're sedentary, or if they're not employed and stay at home, what their activities of daily living are, et cetera. So these are all the spheres of quality of life that can be affected by overactive bladder. And it's sort of a composite of all these that generally forces someone uh, to seek treatment. It can be sexual, occupational, domestic, uh, social, psychological, physical. Patients have to limit their physical activities, et cetera. Well, I mean, what is overactive bladder? What's, what's the pathophysiology? First of all, what is it we're trying to explain here? Well, I think we're trying to explain two things and the etiology, the pathophysiology may not be the same. Number one, we're trying to explain involuntary bladder contractions. Number two, we're trying to explain the sensation of urgency. So I think there are basically five sort of theories that I think can make sense. Um, some of them are competing, uh, which is what I meant initially by, you know, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, but a, a lot of knowledge can be a dangerous thing too. And we'll go through each of these very briefly. So this is the easiest to understand. This is Chet de Groot's, you know, famous diagram of the neural axis, okay? An interruption of the axis at basically any one of these points, suprapontine, you know, just stroke, axonal pass in the spinal cord, you can also have increased lower urinary tract afferent output that can be due to a neurogenic cause, loss of peripheral inhibition, etc. So any of these can result in involuntary bladder contractions. And if the patient has sensation, you know, most patients with MS, their sensation is fine. Parkinson's, same thing. Um, they'll have the classical overactive bladder, somebody with a spinal cord injury, you know, they have <clears throat> involuntary bladder contractions without sensation resulting in leakage, et cetera. You know, those are pretty easy to understand. The myogenic theory that was put forth by Alison Brading in Great Britain, basically what that says is that patients with overactive bladder have partial denervation of the motor innervation of the bladder, partial denervation. When the end organ becomes denervated, um, and actually this would require the postganglionic parasympathetic fiber being injured, but when that happens, you get a form of denervation supersensitivity with increased excitability of the muscle cells and also increased ability for the activity of the muscle cells to spread from one cell to another. Ultimately, this results in coordinated myogenic contractions, increased bladder pressure, which either can cause what looks like an involuntary bladder contraction, or the activity simply feeds back to the central nervous system and is interpreted as the sensation of urgency. Carl Eric Anderson came up with this theory. During filling and storage, there should be no discharge through the parasympathetic system. 
he proposed that at least some of these patients have a leak of acetylcholine during filling and storage, causing micromotion of the detrusor bundles, resulting in afferent activation that's interpreted at the central nervous system level as urgency. Jim Gillespie from Great Britain, this is sort of a vague theory, but bladder smooth muscle exhibits autonomous activity, which it does. This can be modified by too much excitatory input or too little inhibitory input, again, resulting in more micromotion, you know, more activity than usual, feeds back on the central nervous system with a sensation of urgency. Laurie Berger, Carl Eric Anderson again, and many other people have proposed that some of the afferent activity comes from the urethelium because there are receptors and nerves in the urethelium and suburethelium. With bladder distension, these can be activated by a number of compounds released there, notably acetylcholine, ATP, uh, plus prostaglandins. These signals are transmitted to the central nervous system by nerves that are identified suburethelially in the smooth muscle and in the basal urethelium. This is Carl Eric Anderson's diagram of basically what happens with distension. Some of these excitatory transmitters are released. They basically stimulate the afferent nerves. Uh, this feeds back on the central nervous system is interpreted as urgency, which can just cause urgency or may result in a reflex that causes urgency incontinence, that is detrusor overactivity and involuntary <clears throat> bladder contraction. So if you look at all these, I mean, my personal opinion is that there's no single hypothesis that explains all instances of involuntary bladder contractions or occurrences of urgency and frequency. I think four of these concepts are valid. Faulty central inhibition, uh, Chetagrotes, myogenic, yep, sometimes Allison Brading, and you know, sort of Jim Gillespie's concept, Carl Eric's acetylcholine leak, and Laurie Berger's urethelial initiation by release of excitatory uh, neurotransmitters with distension. Now, if that's true, then overactive bladder in a given individual can be due to only one of these or a combination. And I think that this may explain why some treatments are more efficacious in some people than others. Well, how about evaluation and management? Well, you've been told to use the guidelines and you should. This is the algorithm, the AUA um, algorithm, basically of what they call non-neurogenic overactive bladder in adults. I'm not sure it'd be a lot different for neurologic except taking care of the strictly neurologic conditions. So this is pretty simple. Urinalysis, make sure they don't have an infection, physical examination, talk to the patient about what it is they expect, very important, because you don't cure overactive bladder. Your, your goal is to really improve the symptoms. The AUA guidelines really say to institute behavioral therapy first, and then if that doesn't work, combine it with drugs. You know, I think in order to save some time on the patient's behalf, since behavioral therapy doesn't cost anything except for time, you know, behavioral therapy and drug therapy should always be combined together. The two of them work better than either one by itself. Um, and if you do that and you meet your treatment goals, that's fine. If you don't meet your treatment goals with that, then basically is when you get into the more extensive evaluation and also you get into the treatments for so-called refractory overactive bladder, which we'll talk about later. Now, this is a pathway that SUFU, the Society, <coughs> excuse me, for Urodynamics, Female Pelvic Medicine and Urogenital Reconstruction came up with along with the AUA. It's a little more extensive, but not, a, not any more complicated. So here's the goal to rule out other problems. This is what's required. Um, basically, 
bladder diary, I think, shouldn't be optional, although many patients won't do it, a three-day bladder diary. I think the one thing everybody agrees on is initially you don't need to do urodynamics, cystoscopy, you know, et cetera. I mean, I do think personally that a post-void residual urine um, is valuable. Uh, the AUA listed as optional. Next thing is you basically do behavioral modification. And with that, you talk about uh, available treatments, what the sequence is that you're going to follow and explain to the patients that I would say all OAB treatments can improve but do not eliminate the symptoms. And here's behavioral treatment. We'll talk about drug therapy. Um, how long do you try that for? Well, four to eight weeks I think is reasonable. And if that doesn't work, then you go on to perhaps a more complicated evaluation and what we call treatment of refractory overactive bladder. Here are all the potential management strategies. Uh, this is what we do mostly. Number one, someone with a big residual urine, um, you can decrease their residual urine and thereby increase the functional bladder capacity. You may not decrease the bladder capacity at which urgency occurs, but you may make it less you may make it occur less frequently. If you decrease the volume of urine delivered to the bladder, same thing. And if you treat some associated factors, for instance, bladder outlet obstruction in a patient that has BPH and OAB, successfully treat the obstruction, 60 to 70% of the time, the OAB symptoms will be considerably mitigated within six to 12 months. The same thing applies to significant pelvic pore prolapse. The same thing applies to the coexistence of stress incontinence and overactive bladder, where stress incontinence is the most predominant symptom. So first thing we start with generally is behavioral modifications and drugs. So what's the ideal drug? Well, I think everybody would agree that these are the goals of an ideal drug. Okay, pretty simple. And the key is a concept called uroselectivity that Carl Eric Anderson came up with. That is, just affect the bladder. Don't affect anything else. Well, we all know with drugs that's not entirely possible, um, but that's certainly a goal. It's important that the patient understand these treatment goals. A realistic goal is symptom improvement. And if the patient's expectations are not realistic, then they are going to be disappointed with the treatment and more likely to discontinue it. These are the metrics that people usually use when they're doing a study on a pharmacologic agent, on behavioral modification, um, on any kind of therapy for refractory overactive bladder uh, to see whether these improve. I've distilled the AUA guidelines basically to these. The AUA guidelines, as I said before, say that the behavioral should be first line therapy. So if you're asked that, that's the answer. I think behavioral should be combined with drug treatment. They list antimuscarinics or beta-3 agonists. There's only one, Mirabegron at the moment, as second line therapy. Extended relief preparations seem to work better than immediate relief. You can use transdermal oxybutynin. If you have inadequate control, you can modify the dose of an anti-muscarinic or beta-3 for those refractory to one or add one to the other. No anti-muscarinics in patients that have narrow angle glaucoma, unless the ophthalmologist says it's well controlled, okay. Don't use it in patients that have gastric emptying or urinary retention. What's urinary retention? Well, most people would say, you know, over 150 or 200 mLs. Before you stop an antimuscarinic, try to manage the side effects like complicate or like constipation. Uh, be cautious with antimuscarinics when the patient's already on other medications that have antimuscarinic properties. Be cautioned 
with any frail patients using any medications, even beta 3s. And obviously, if you're refractory to behavioral modification and med or oral medications, you need to either be prepared to manage that or send it on to someone else. So what is behavioral therapy for this? Well, behavioral therapy includes everything that's on this pinwheel. Uh, keep avoiding diary, that in itself is behavioral therapy. Fluid and diet management, don't flood yourself during the day, don't flood yourself at night. Um, medication management, if you're bothered at one particular time of day, then regulate your medication to take it just you know before that particular time of day. Teach people pelvic floor exercises and teach them to use those in a very specific way to delay their voiding. So this is what behavioral therapy includes. Micturition charts and diaries, very important as a part of reinforcement. Now, behavioral therapy by itself can improve the, at least in continence episodes, 50% or greater. What do these two terms mean? Well, they're actually a good explanation in the Urology Care Foundation documents. The knack means you know how to do a pelvic floor exercise. You know how to contract the periurethral muscles. Once you learn the knack, and there are various ways to teach patients how to do that, you shouldn't contract your rectus muscles when you do the knack. It's just the periurethral muscles. Once you learn how to do that, rather than contracting them and holding them for long periods of time as you would for stress incontinence to build up the musculature, you use what are called quick flicks. In other words, you get the sensation of urgency. You stop what you're doing and you can track that muscle back and forth quickly like that. And most of the time, those quick flicks will abort an involuntary bladder contraction. Now, Kathy Bergio, basically did this study in both females first and most recently in men. Drug and behavioral therapy combined have a greater potential to enhance outcome looking for urgent continence parameters than either by itself. That's why I say use them together. So what about the individual drugs? Well, most people look at antimuscarinics. They say, oh yeah, that's easy inhibits the acetylcholine and the stops contraction, um, et cetera. Well, actually, the available data don't support the conclusion that the antimuscarinics used as we use them with the dosages exert their therapeutic action by inhibiting bladder contractility. They exert them by inhibiting sensation or sensory impulses. So in the usual doses, that we use them, antimuscarinics don't affect bladder empty in patients with OAB. If you give high doses, sure, you can produce retention. But in an overactive bladder, when you're not trying to put them in retention, they act during filling and storage and not during empty. As Carl Eric Anderson's diagram, the therapeutic window for these medications is here. So where they primarily affect afferent activity, when you get to higher doses as you might use in neurogenic patients and the antimuscarinic concentration becomes greater, that's when you begin to affect voiding contraction. These are all the antimuscarinics and the drugs with mixed actions that are given a 1A rating, the ICI, International Continence, or the International Consultation on Incontinence, as I said, has a meeting every three years or so. They put out a textbook called Incontinence. They, they rate evidence according to the Oxford system and they give basically a rating for usage. These are all 1A drugs. In other words, every single one of these. This is what you can expect with an antimuscarinic. Now, these are median results. They're different from mean results. The mean results are generally lower for some reason, but the medians, if you work with medians for urgent continence reduction, urgency, episode reduction, frequency reduction, et cetera, 
this is what you can expect in terms of drugs and placebos. Pretty much any metric you use for quality of life is going to increase with both the drug and placebo, more so hopefully with the drugs. But these are useful numbers to remember. These are the adverse events of antimuscarinics that I think you're all familiar with. There was a scare about cardiac effects a few years ago. Again, in the clinical doses that we use antimuscarinics, that doesn't happen. Cognitive, well, this is the EAU's level of evidence. This was a couple of years ago, but now everyone pretty much agrees that antimuscarinics have the capacity anyway to cause cognitive dysfunction. This basically was, this is a tombstone that I put in this, but this was the conclusions and relevance of this article in JAMA Neurology in 2016. The use of anticholinergic medication was associated with increased brain atrophy and dysfunction and clinical decline. So this use among older adults should likely be discouraged if alternative therapies are available. These are the EAU guidelines from 2020. Offer the drugs in patients with UUI, extended release, just like the AUA. If it's ineffective, consider raising the dose or offering a different antimuscarinic or a beta-3 agonist or combination. And look at these patients, you know, when do you review them again? when you change the medication or put them on something, I think a month. EAU, they call it like they see it. There is limited evidence that one antimuscarinic drug is superior to an alternative antimuscarinic drug for cure or improvement of urgency urinary incontinence. You can increase the dose, uh, but when you do that, you can expect higher rates of adverse events, right? I mean, everyone knows that. Now, I'll just give you a, a hint as to how I look at drugs. Um, I generally go back to the FDA approved labeling for the product. In other words, what was submitted to the FDA? Because once that happens, there are all sorts of ways to do studies, to manipulate them, to make your product look great, somebody else's product look not so great. This is what the FDA allows. They don't allow urgency episodes. They allow micturition frequency, urgency incontinence episodes, and volume voided. And they use means and not medians. So let's just take two, the last two, solifenacin and fesoteridine. Okay. Now further, you'll see that the baselines are always different in, in these studies. So most people just provide a fixed number of reductions in something. But the, the problem is it doesn't express that as a percent decrease. In other words, there's no baseline to allow a straightforward interpretation of data to see the difference between drug and placebo. So I like using the ratio of the percent change with drug and the percent change with placebo, which levels the playing field and gives you an idea of relative mag or relative magnitude. So let's just take incontinence episodes with solifenacin and fesoteridine. Not to say one's better than the other, but you know, here this is, these are basically different studies. This is two studies with solifenacin five. This is fesoteridine four. This is the baseline. This is the amount that incontinence episodes decrease by. This is the percentage reduction. And you can see that depending on the baseline and depending on how much they, they decreased, you get a better idea of looking at the percentages. So here's a 61% decrease in, in this study, and here's 54, but this had a 41% reduction with placebo. So the drug placebo ratio basically is probably gonna be pretty close to the same. And you know, here's another one, 54 and 32, 45 and 27, et cetera. So if you put all these on one table and you look at drug placebo ratios, this is SOLI 5 versus placebo. This is SOLI 10. You can see there's not a lot of difference here. This is FESO 4. This is FESO 8. And you'll see with Mirabegron, um, the EAU says Mirabegron is a 
as effective as an antimuscarinic, um, is it really if you look at drug placebo ratios? So here's an ethical question for another day. The placebo effect is a big portion of a drug effects. You know, should we basically say, oh, you know, it doesn't work very well, or should we take advantage of the placebo effect? What should we do? What's ethical? And when what's practical? So another day. So in the elderly, Mirabegron has been shown to be efficacious and safe in elderly patients. So it looks like it's a commercial for Mirabegron in the elderly. In older people, the cognitive effect of drugs with anticholinergics, cumulative increases with length of exposure. So consider the load. Use non-pharmacologic treatment first. Be careful of long-term anti-muscarinic treatment in the elderly. Anti-muscarinics in men, you can use these. Who shouldn't you use them in? Well, the EAU says if your residual is over 150, you should use them with great caution. Little question that when you combine an anti-muscarinic with an alpha-1 blocker and somebody that has BPH and symptomatology from that and overactive bladder, that you get a bigger bang for your buck in reducing these filling slash storage symptoms than by using an alpha blocker or placebo by itself. So it's not uncommon to see someone with BPH and overactive bladder symptoms and obstruction and some residual on an antimuscarinic because the doses that we use should really not affect emptying. Problem with antimuscarinics? Well, they don't have much persistence, do they? This is for all of them. Now, Mirabegron has a slightly better persistence, and I think that's because it has fewer side effects. So basically, 70 to 75% of people, you know, are probably off antimuscarinics by the end of the year, either because they found them ineffective or they have too many side effects. Find to use antimuscarinics and neurogenic, get the same effect. First line medical treatment for neurogenic the truths are overactivity. That's from the EAU. What about beta-3 agonists? Well, right now there's only one on the market in the US. This is the mechanism of action, not gonna dwell on this. Um, you can certainly you know, look this up. Suffice it to say that no one is really sure. Like the anti-muscarinics, there's some element of afferent inhibition, um, but let's leave it and just say that it's effective. Again, um, this is 1A efficacy from the International Consultation on Incontinence for lower urinary tract symptoms with overactive bladder and or detrusor overactivity. This is basically what you get with Mirabegron. Again, looking at the drug and the placebo, this is percent reduction, okay? And this is with Mirabegron 50 in two studies, and this comes right from the prescribing information, no tricks here, level playing field. This is a study with Mirabegron 25, 50, and placebo. Not a lot of difference between 25 and 50 here. This is the drug placebo ratio, again, compared to two antimuscarinics. You know, to look at this, it doesn't look as though this is as potent as the anti-muscarinics for decreasing incontinence episodes. Side effects of Mirabegron, pretty much equal to placebo, except in this one group, actually the lower dose, surprising, 11.3% risk of hypertension, therefore the warning about hypertension in the package inserts. However, the EAU guidelines state adverse events rates with Mirabegron are similar to placebo. I think one of the good uses of Mirabegron is if you have a drug like solifenacin or fesoteridine or whatever, that instead of increasing the dose of that drug, you should add Mirabegron because you will get approximately the same therapeutic effect as you would by doubling the dose of the antimuscarinic without the added side effects that doubling the dose of antimuscarinics is going to bring. You can use beta agonists in men, the same as um, 
with uh, anti muscarinics and in fact these may affect contractility uh, even more. There haven't been that many studies done on beta agonist use in men as there have been with anti muscarinics. What about alpha blockers for overactive bladder? This comes from the International Consultation on Incontinence. Basically, what the ICI says is after looking up a bunch of articles, if you treat lower urinary tract symptoms in a patient that has symptoms suggestive of BPH and overactive bladder, that you can make those better. But if you have only storage symptoms alone, that you won't make the storage symptoms alone better in men with alpha blockers. In women, they concluded that alpha blockers were ineffective for treating the symptoms of overactive bladder in women. PDE5 inhibitors in men, this is the EAU. Um, you can certainly use these inhibitors in men with moderate to severe lower urinary tract symptoms, whether or not they have erectile dysfunction. I just read an article the other day saying that if you use this with an alpha blocker, that you will get a bigger bang for your buck than with either one alone, which means to me that you don't have to use them together, but if you're not getting an effect and you wanna do something other than increase the dose of the alpha blocker, I think it's okay to add a, a PDE5 that you can basically give every day. Estrogen, if you give systemic estrogen, you'll make incontinence worse. If you give topical estrogen, at least in women, it seems to improve frequency and urgency, whether it's really an effect on overactive bladder or whether it's an effect <clears throat> on just vulvovaginal atrophy, no one seems to know, but it's helpful. And if you use it just topically, it doesn't seem to be harmful. What about refractory overactive bladder? Well. First thing you have to do is make sure it's not a misdiagnosis or the patients just haven't been compliant with what regimen that you prescribed. This is the SUFU AUA guideline about advanced therapy or refractory overactive bladder. This is when it's fine to use urodynamic studies or even cystoscopy if you think there's an indication or video urodynamics, including uh, imaging of the lower urinary tract. And basically, these are the three things that constitute management for refractory. Uh, PTNS, sacral neuromodulation, botulinum toxin. PTNS is basically based on the teaching of acupuncture. Ed McGuire reported this in 1983, but using transcutaneous stimulation in patients with neural disorders. No one has ever been able to reproduce this and get um, a good result with transcutaneous. Uh, Marshall Stoller in 2000, Fred Govier in 2001 reported with two different PTNS devices, that is percutaneous with stimulation of the nerves. And these are just some scattered results that are fairly typical of what's reported. PTNS versus tolteridine, approximately 80% cure or improvement uh, versus 55%. This is versus a sham for three months, 54.5% moderate improvement or moderate to marked improvement versus 21%. Improved frequency, nocturia, moderate to severe urgency, urgency incontinence. Maintenance therapy for two years. This was looked at by Ken Peters. So the patients who wanted to continue, in other words, this was sort of a completer study, looked at only the ones that wanted to continue. I mean, basically, if you continued this like one treatment a month, um, you could make this therapy long term. This was the basic reduction, urgency urinary incontinence episodes, uh, pretty dramatic. And this was the voids per day. All the quality of life parameters remained improved as they did in the 12 week trial. So the AUA SUFU guidelines, you can offer PTNS as third line treatment in a carefully selected patient population. The EAU guidelines, effective for improvement of UUI in women, notice they don't mention men, 
no benefit from anti-muscarinics. Maintenance program, okay, up to three years. Yep, it's comparable effectiveness to tilteridine. The one study I showed you showed that it was a bit better. You could also combine the two. No serious adverse events. You don't cure it, but then again, you don't, uh, well, you don't cure the urgency and continence. You don't cure the entire symptom syndrome. And there are implanted devices that are coming along as well. The holy grail, of course, is to develop a successful transcutaneous device that the patient can use at home. Sacral neuromodulation. These are the FDA approval times for the various indications, refractory urgency incontinence first, idiopathic non-obstructive retention, refractory urgency and frequency without incontinence, and refractory fecal incontinence. The EAU guidelines, more effective than a, com a continuation of conservative treatment. Now, the problem with SNS is there's really no sham controls. No one wants to implant these electrodes uh, basically and stick them somewhere else. However, it's been pretty well shown that if you have somebody with a successfully functioning SNS system and you turn it off, their symptoms will return. And if you turn it back on, their symptoms will regress. Uh, we'll talk about a study between SNS and Botox shortly. In those patients who have been implanted at long term, 50% improvement is maintained in at least 50% of patients. 15% may remain cured. Advancement in the electrodes and the way of securing them um, has resulted in improvement in results over the years. Candidates for SNS, or it's actually any, any type of sacral neurostimulation, not interstim. It's not a commercial for interstim or for axonics. Best results, well, failed, conservative, neurologically intact. Um, history of herniated intervertebral disc, that's odd. Younger women in overactive bladder more so than urinary retention and ones that have few medical comorbidities. Negative predictors, neurologic disease greater than three medical comorbidities, older men, longer duration of symptoms. This is some selected results in terms of urgency, urinary incontinence. This, these are the six month results of those treated. Now remember that in most of the reports for SNS, what you're seeing is completer results. That is those who have successfully passed the first stage of implantation for those who do basically two stages, put in the electrodes, test them out, only go ahead with the permanent implant and ones that test positive. If you do obviously a one stage, then you're basically taking everybody into consideration. So this is SNS versus standard medical therapy in people that have failed at least one medication. Now for mechanical devices, the FDA requires reporting in terms of 50% or more reduction. So here's sacral nerve stimulation and basically here's medication. Here's another looking at basically average four years follow-up. Again, the same parameter, urgency, urinary incontinence, 70% success, 50% or greater improvement, 20% dry. 68% had 50% greater improvement with urgency frequency. In their series of non-obstructive retention, 70% uh, had a 50% or greater improvement. Problem, 41% required at least one device or treatment-related surgical intervention uh, over this time period, 1996 to 2010. This is a series that Philip von Karabrek reported in 2007, so you can consider it somewhat early, but these are the cumulative adverse events over here, and 60 patients required repeat surgery for 110 adverse events in that series. What about Botox? Well, this is the, one of the original studies on Botox and neurogenic OAB. That was the first indication, patients that leak between catheterizations, et cetera. Um, 200 units and 300 unit, Brigitte Church, 
who was pretty much acknowledged by most as the person who developed the therapy, you can see not much difference between 200 and 300, but a substantial reduction in the number of urinary incontinence episodes. These were the baselines per day. This is the dry rate with placebo, the dry rate with 200 units. This is non-neurogenic. This is not the same person, Dr. Schmidt. Uh, these were patients treated with 100, which is the recommended dose in the US for non-neurogenic. For neurogenic, it's 200. Clinical results in this group, 82% resolution of urgency, 86% resolution of incontinence. Those are pretty spectacular results. I don't think everybody would agree that that's in their system. And look at Nocturia, four to 1.5, wow. In that series, some urinary retention, poor outcome for mostly due to decreased compliance. Repeat injections seem to work as well as the initial ones. The therapy lasts in neurogenics, average of nine months in non-neurogenics, about nine months. Repeats are as effective. Some patients do develop antibodies and the repeat injections do not work as well. But other than that, there's been no real tolerance, you know, that, that occurs with the medication. Um, safety, well, yep, people do go into retention. In neurogenic bladder, that may be the goal. And in the non-neurogenics, less than 10% go into retention. There's been some problem in labeling exactly what retention is. You know, how many cc's is that? Uh, many times, I think, the patients have a residual of 150 or 200. They're symptomatically better. They're called in retention, and yet that resolves over time. There have been a few reports of muscle weakness away from the site of injection, um, mostly with dysport. Some people use Botox to inject the strided sphincter in patients with detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. Um, those are mostly patients with upper level spinal cord injuries. So here's recommendations for Botox from the EAU. Um, single injection, 100, more effective than placebo. Repeated injections are okay. They don't have reduced efficacy. If you inject older, frail patients, they have a higher incidence of retention. Yep, there is an infection rate, but the clinical significance of that is uncertain. Um, it's superior to the antimuscarinics for cure of urgency incontinence, but the rates of improvement, they're about equivalent. So here were the recommendations. Uh, offer 100 units. This is basically for non-neurogenic patients. Um, warn the patients that they may have to self-catheterize. It's been also effective, as in fact, the first use was in patients with neurourologic disorders. Um, so recommendations, you can use it in patients to reduce neurogenic detrusor overactivity. Some people inject it in the bladder neck as well for bladder neck dysfunction. Here's a study between Botox and sacral neuromodulation, well done. Basically, let's just look at the findings. Botox had a greater mean daily urgency incontinence reduction over six months. You can see it wasn't that much more. And not sure what the percentage would be, statistically, but small difference. UTIs, need for self-cath, more frequent. Inclusion, greater reduction in episodes of urgency incontinence but limited by the small magnitude of the difference and the greater likelihood of some adverse events. So this is basically the comparison. This is the ITT population. This is the clinical responder population. You can see not much of a difference. Two-year outcomes, not much of a difference in conclusion between that and the initial study. So sacral neuromodulation, the positive things, you can test for efficacy prior if you do two stages. Minimal UTIs, no retention in patients with overactive bladder. You can treat non-obstructive urinary retention. You can treat 
uh, so-called DHIC, detrusor hyperreflexia and impaired contractility, was the original way to phrase that. What it means is a combination of overactive bladder during filling and storage and detrusor underactivity during emptying. You can also treat fecal incontinence. You can treat refractory detrusor overactivity alone. You can adjust the parameters and it's reversible either by taking it out or turning it off. Negative factors. It requires an operation with the risks of infection, may get pain or other symptoms from the device. This is changing now. Um, there's another company that makes sacral nerve stimulators um, where it's MRI safe. I suspect the other company will come out with one soon. Battery life, uh, there's this other company also has a rechargeable battery. So supposedly you'll have to change the battery only every 15 years. For Botox, the advantages, short procedure, local anesthesia possible, no device, no wound, no MRI issue, and the efficacy with incontinence is marginally better. The negatives, you can't tell whether it's gonna work beforehand. There's a risk of retention has a negative effect on detrusor underactivity, makes it worse. You can't treat DHIC and overactive bladder during filling and storage and detrusor underactivity during emptying unless you wanna put the patient into retention. It's not removable or immediately reversible. Rarely you get spread and weakness elsewhere. Increased urinary tract infection risk and no effect on fecal incontinence. So I hope that hasn't been overdone. But I uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer, you know, basically any questions. You can ask the questions verbally or put them on Q&A or, you know, put them on chat or basically um, whatever you'd like to do. No questions. The you know the chapter in the New Campbell CWW, um, the good chapter on overactive bladder in there. Um, I think it basically doesn't leave uh, too many stones unturned. Okay, well, sorry for going over a bit. Um, I enjoyed putting this together and I hope you enjoyed listening to it. You can, you know, send me any questions that you want. Uh, here's one question. When would you get your dynamics for overactive bladder? You know, I think basically if the combination of behavioral therapy and anti-muscarinics or antimuscarinics along with an increased dose or addition of a beta-3 agonist, if that doesn't work and you need to go on to any other type of therapy, except perhaps for PTNS, I, you know, since PTNS is reversible, et cetera, the complications are minimal, I, I don't think that you need your dynamics for that. Um, as I said initially, I like to get a post-void residual in everybody before I start. Um, so you can count that as a urodynamic study or not. But in the majority of people at the beginning, you know, unless they've been treated by someone else and failed, I don't think you need urodynamics or uh, cystoscopy in those patients. Looks like no other questions.
Um, contact, okay, it's A-L-A-N dot W-E-I-N at Penn Medicine dot U-P-E-N-N U -P -E -N -N dot E-D-U. Don't ask me why they have such a long email address, but it's a nuisance to type it every time. So it's A-L-A-N dot W-E-I-N at Penn Medicine dot U-P-E-N dot E-D-U. Thanks very much.